second and then we should pop right up um make sure that i can see some comments but we are we are now live um let's see where is my comment stuff um so we'll have a couple people on the on the comment side but uh, it's nicola welcome welcome to the Grizzle king show man super good to have you thanks yeah, I'm, I'm uh, psyched to see you on here. We were just talking about uh, how I had found Laura and how I kind of made built this business out of explaining Laura to people. And, and you're sitting there like the guy who invented it. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could probably tell you a couple yeah, of things. Let, let, let me be precise. One of the guys. One of the guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You and a uh, uh, school friend. You know, there was two of us. <laughs> two of you, yeah. Yeah. And it was in 2012, right? So now 10, 10 years ago or 13 years well, ago. Well, actually, uh, 20. Uh, so no, it was in 2010. 2010. Okay. And we we sold, so we had set up a small startup called the Cyclio, and we sold it to Semtech. And Laura started really to take off when it, once it was acquired by Semtech, and the and the sell was in twenty in twenty twelve, effectively. Oh, okay, so tw- that that lines up because I had looked at some of the um, videos, kind of prepping for this from the interviews. And actually, I think you and I are the same age. I was born in seventy seven. I think I think we're. Uh, 76. So 76. I'm, yeah, you're, you're, you're a youngster. You got me by a year. Yeah, you got to. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and then, uh, funnily enough, we just kind of figured this out uh, pre-show, is that you're also occasionally flying paragliders. You're living in France at the at the epicenter of, or one of the epicenters for paragliding. So kind of pretty cool. We got some of these like <laughs> intersecting things and, and have not yet met. So. Yeah, and, and, and the company I just, you know, I set up a couple of years ago is, is about, you know, recovering people in in mountainous areas yeah yeah which is which is how i got into uh into laura so maybe we start we start there at the kind of present day with apik is what what are you doing what are you doing now so apic we will say apic apic Apic. is a company based in uh, chambéry so very close to grenoble in the french alp in uh, in france and it's a small company basically using uh, laura to build uh, safety beacons kind of device, rug device here. Yep. And the idea there is really to be a, so um, maybe you're familiar with uh, an avalanche beacon. Or yep. So basically what you carry and you, when you go cross country skiing and yep. things like this, okay? So the idea there is to design uh, more or less the next generation, you know, the future yep. of uh, avalanche beacon. So um, it's uh, an avalanche, if you want, it's as precise as an avalanche beacon, because basically we can recover or we can find one of this stuff meters under snow with like a meter accuracy. We really know where to dig. We'll, we locate somebody, even if it's buried in the snow, very accurately. But we can detect it, uh, you know, um, nearly five miles away from the helicopter. So when you're actually looking for somebody, you have a search range of five miles. Yeah. Okay. And this is pure local communication. It's just this device. Uh, Transmitting periodically a beacon, a LoRa beacon yep. that's received by an apparatus on board the helicopter, the receiver on the helicopter. Yeah. And on top of that, this is actually also connected to a LoRa One network if they exist around you. Yeah. And periodically transmitting your position to whatever LoRa One networks, could be helium, could be orange, could be anything uh, uh, around you. Oh, this is so cool. Okay, so it's it's ah, oh, it's rad to talk to you. So. Let's see, I think 2021, last year, I went up to Utah and there was a paragliding, uh, it's called a hike and fly race. So everybody starts off down in the valley, yeah. you kind of run up, you know what this is. Maybe the listeners don't, because this is like, in, in Europe, paragliding's huge. In, in the US, there's only about 5,000 of us. In Europe, there's about 100,000 pilots. Yeah, yeah, it's huge, yeah. Principally here in Grenoble, it flies every day, nearly. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, I, I gotta get over there and fly. It's like a place to, a mecca for it. Um, so this race was going on and I was like, well, I found this Laura thing a year before in 2020. We should try and track the paragliders here in this race. And so, you know, it's funny because I'm going up there with like an oyster tracker and handing it out to everybody. And I went up and set up a couple helium gateways and it was kind of a helium uh, press thing that we did. But here you are like, because we had had this idea that we should be able to fly a gateway around in a helicopter, which is what it sounds like you're doing as well. I know, it's not, let me show you what we fly in the helicopter is... Uh... Oh, it's uh, actually a dedicated equipment. It's this uh, radio box that you connect to a cell phone. Okay. And there is a, a, a dedicated application. And this is uh, um, much more than a gateway because it, it receives the LoRa packets transmitted by uh, the safety beacon, but yep. it also guides a search to it, even in case where there is no GPS available. So 
even if the GPS, because when you bury it, for example, or when you in a cave or when you in, in, under deep uh, tree coverage, sometimes the GPS doesn't lock the GPS right. of your beacon. So the coordinate transmitted by the beacon are either not accurate or there's even no position to transmit. Yep. And here, this, this uh, equipment there will guide you to the beacon even without even requiring GPS. Okay, it will basically it... give you a direction and a distance yeah. and it will guide the helicopter pilot towards the victim directly. Dang, so even if there's like multi-path stuff going on, if they're down deep in some yeah. canyon, it'll bounce yeah, up yeah, that yeah, canyon yeah. and then come out and say like, okay, well, it's four miles this way or two miles that way. Or uh, so so in case of, uh, initially in case of multi-path, it won't be very precise, but it will still guide you in the right direction. Yep. And as you get closer, you get line of sight. And as you get line of sight, it becomes super precise. Yeah. And so... Yeah, we have, we have tested it with, you know, in crevasse in the Chamonix Mont Blanc with the, uh, yeah. uh, with the uh, search and rescue team there. We've tested it, in, you know, many, many places now uh, there. And that's really, uh, you know, uh, my job on that device was actually to design that uh, uh, search equipment and, uh, and the, the procedure around it. Yeah. Uh, the, the rest, honestly, is a GPS chip and, uh, and the microcontroller and the LoRa chipset. And right. it's kind of a, it's the usual tracker, but the, the extra bit, the extra magic is this, is the search and rescue mode. Okay. So when you plug it into a phone, does the phone have an app that you're kind of looking at and saying like, okay, it's in this direction and, and wherever? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So the, the phone app will have a map background and on the map background, it will constantly in real time display uh, the estimated, the newest estimated position of the, of the beacon you, you want to find. So okay. as soon as it receives signal, at, at the beginning, it indicates an area on the map, and as you get closer and you circle around it with the helicopter, it gets it gets more precise and more precise until it's a point. And when it's a point, it's like really ten meter accurate. You can Dang. you can go there, you'll find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so that's super accurate. All right. Um, and can you watch all of these things in real time from like back at HQ, so someone can see like, all right, here's my, you know, like when I grew yes. up, I used to go skiing. You go to a ski school, you got ten uh, kids or twenty so, kids. Funnily enough, so uh, we've we've never we've never actually equipped a paragliding competition, but we have already equipped, for example, trail competitions mm -hmm. with runners. Yep. yep. And effectively, um, the uh, 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 families can actually watch the runner real time, the position on okay. the circuit. So, but you do need gateways to to monitor that. You can uh, have like a. Oh, that, yes. Yeah. Exactly. If you want to, from the back end, if you want to share position with people across the internet or you know even with base you do need gateways so actually uh, at apic for special event like trail we have a dedicated team in apic that will a couple of days before that will uh, helicopter up gateways on the highest point around so that basically will simulate the coverage exactly yeah. like what you're doing with your LinkedIn. Yeah. and they will install uh, we have uh, dedicated small solar gateways totally power you know uh, yeah. battery backed up yeah uh, that can work anywhere yeah. And uh, we are either, either using a satellite backhaul or cellular backhaul when it's available yep. for those gateways. But they are, you know, fairly standard LoRa 1 gateways, except they are uh, energy autonomous. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Super. It's so, it, Nicola, it's so funny because this is like this off grid hotspot thing is what I got, quote, famous for. And Helium is like building these things with solar panels and batteries and the rest of it. And, and mm -hmm. actually, on this call watching this, there's a guy named Travis Teague who, is, who uh, worked for Helium, now Nova. Um, doing some of the kind of the first testing on some of these off-grid things. So it's like mm -hmm. the stuff that we were discovering in like 2020. It sounds like you guys were, were way ahead of that. Which no, is... no, no, no. Uh, honestly, this uh, um, uh, uh, working with big uh, sport uh, events mm -hmm. uh, really only started last year for us. Ah, okay. All right. And, and so, and so, and to be extremely frank with you, uh, our, uh, you know, Zeus Solar gateway, Gateways, they are basically, you know, a, a Pelly case of the energy management system that we actually put together, but then it's a, it's a purely standard multi tech gateway, yeah. Inside, yeah, yeah. Cool. We use one of those, you know, slick blue metal multi tech gateway, okay. Uh, uh, inside, and because it's one of the lowest power we found in the market today. Ah, and for you guys, uh, let's see, is there any interest? Are you looking at using helium, or did, I think you were, were saying of just course, actually, we are. Uh, Epic is actually uh, in discussion with Helium to negotiate a roaming agreement with them. So okay. basically, uh, in in ski resorts and where we actually have a big customer base, we actually operate our own gateways. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
across, you know, during uh, all, all the time, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you've already we, got it like fixed some, on some resort. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have some fixed installation in some ski resorts that yep. we operate. So we are also a network operator, so a private network operator. Huh. But uh, getting the additional coverage of Helium gateways worldwide is, of course, super sexy for us. Yeah. So we actually, this is really one of the things we're going to push uh, this year is we want to, to get an agreement with Helium such that our beacons can be directly received by any Helium gate, uh, gateway. And they will roam, if you, if you know this roaming uh, interface, yep. Yep. They will basically forward the packet to us, yep. such that if there is any any helium gateway in the vicinity, we know where you are, and you can press the SOS button, and and you'll you'll uh, you'll get the uh, alert services. Yeah, it's funny. So most of the time, I'd be like, "Hey, let me know if I can help you connect to anyone." But you fucking invented this thing, so you probably have all the connects that you need. But yeah, if there's anything I can do to help you in helium, let, let me know. What? <laughs> so what did you? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. What did you think when you saw Helium start to blow up, right? Because you you and your buddy come up with this technology and something like 10 years later, mm -hmm. you know, Helium is now the largest, whatever, contiguous wireless network in the world. There's something like, I think they say there's 900,000 out there, but there's about 500,000 yeah, yeah. online. Mm -hmm. Like, what were your thoughts kind of watching this thing? Hey, so, uh, uh, so to be very honest, at the beginning, I was uh, feeling quite dubious. Uh, about the whole concept, and then I then I remember they put on the internet a white paper on you know how they will build, uh, build the actual proof of coverage concept. Yep. And and I read that white paper, and at the moment I said, yeah, God, these guys are clever. This is very clever uh, indeed. So the whole concept of proof of coverage inside the blockchain uh, that you can therefore nurture, and the concept that you reward. Uh, people who actually pay to put online a gateway for the coverage they provide to the network. I found that really clever. And yeah. I started to believe huh. uh, this would work at this time. Huh. And then did you ever put up a Helium gateway? Did you like, oh, I'll try one? Uh, no. Uh, so, I, uh, so you were at Semtech when this started, right? Funny, been... But, you know, as the inventor of LoRa, I never had the LoRa gateway at home. <laughs> really? <laughs> so... Dude. <laughs> So, so uh, I played a lot with it. So basically, I I mostly spend my life playing with the advanced stuff. So yeah. you know, just the, the next step. Sure, and, sure. And Helium gateway were just you know for me they were just you know straight uh, SX thirteen oh one chip. So like they were the old generation chip. I was yeah. working on something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Because it, well, it's, it's so, now uh, thirteen oh two. Or and that, actually, maybe it's the, the, uh, the Helium innovation was not at all on the radio side. They they just purely straight standard LoRa gateways. Yeah. It's on the firmware they put on the gateway yeah. and the and the, and the, the, this this mining concept around the gateway, but that's entirely software or yeah. firmware. There is nothing, nothing really in physical and, area. And as Semtech, we were just selling them radio chip like any other gateway manufacturer. There was nothing yeah. special about Helium for us. Yeah. At, at first, except the sheer volume. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, I don't know much about the the business side of it, but I can't imagine that there's anything there's, that's that's very close as far as number of units moved in some amount of time. There's yeah, just so I, I know. I, so, so as I mentioned to you, I, I'm not. Uh, I I left Semtech two years ago in yep. 2020. Yep. And the real big hike of Ilium happened last year, basically. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but yeah, I know this represents huge volume. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it was crazy. Crazy to watch. I mean, no matter, you didn't have to have a giant business background to see that that was a pretty mm -hmm. good business to be in for a while. And, and it took a little bit of time to, to pick up here in Europe. But actually, the, the reason as Epic, we are interested by the helium coverage is that it's fairly consistent now. So, yeah. of course, in the Alps, you, you, you will never have a helium gateway. And, the, and that's all right. It's totally OK. But in urban environment in France, you now start to have pretty decent coverage. Yeah. Yeah. Although one thing that, that kind of we in the crypto currency world have noticed is that France is one of the most difficult countries to to penetrate with these miners and we're like no one seems to be no one that I've talked to is sure why like we're like are the French just really suspicious of this you know is it something where it's like uh, a you, you you can buy you know your Kerlink who's a French company uh, uh, he's or was selling uh, helium gateways yeah uh, there's actually no problem in selling helium gateway in France yeah. by a friend who you know I know dozens of friends who have helium gateways and yeah. so there's actually nothing wrong. It it, it took uh, it's it's very funny. It took first in the UK uh, and also in Belgium in Europe. 
Huh, yeah. And it, it, it took a lot more time in France and Netherlands, for example. I, I have no idea what. Is it cultural? Is it simply because, you know, there was a club in Brussels that was very vocal about helium and that just all spread? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... We don't know either. It, it's a it's a mysterious thing. There's another uh, project called GeoNet that does GNSS stuff, so down like centimeter accuracy um, positioning, and they're also seeing this like okay, we're getting good spread everywhere else, but France is kind of this whole hole in the gap. How come you, you don't think you'll have gateways up in the Alps? Is it just public land and you can't deploy there? Or? No, 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 not nothing. So it's uh, uh, so first very harsh uh, conditions. Yep. Okay. So typically a solar gateway with a foot of, of snow on it, it's just no use, right? Yep, uh, yep. So solar panels don't work in winter. Yep. Uh, uh, extreme winds. So where you have coverage, I mean, on the top of the mountain, is where you've got icing, wind, and snow. Yeah, OK. So it's extremely hard to maintain equipment there. It's very expensive to maintain it, because these are you walk for hours, or you have to go with the helicopter. Right. So, so and. And there's just nobody. So, you know, what business model could justify installing? So there are some uh, some uh, telecommunication relays up yeah. in the Alps. Yep. And on those relay, on some of those, we have agreements with the public authorities and we can put a LoRa gateway for APIC that's using their electricity supply, you know, because they have huge solar panel arrays and huge battery banks. Yeah. They have battery banks that will last for 15 days without sun. Right. Uh, and and a LoRa gateway is very tiny compared to you know the hundreds of watts yeah, these yeah, guys yeah, are sure. just using, but there are very few of them, and they were installed purely for public security uh, reason, right? For for communication during you know uh, searches and operations and all of that, or by the military or, but so there is, you know. Sometimes, you know, very limited coverage, you have some bubbles of coverage, yeah. but, you know, there is no no global, you know, blanket covering and, right. and it will never happen. Right. And so I guess that's that's why you have the extra piece that you just chuck on a helicopter and then you can get high. And exactly. you can have your... so, so from the ground up, we knew that whatever we design, when you have LoRa one network, well, it's bonus. You have network, you can share your position in real time. Like that, but we have a, we have to have a way to find you without any network, no cellular, without depending on any network, purely on point to point. And well, actually, it's what LoRa is really good at. Yeah, it's long range point to point communication with simple to set up. Yeah, no, it, it's so cool. Super cool. We talked a little bit about the mesh tastic stuff, too. And it seemed that like there's probably nothing in LoRa that you haven't seen. Um, what when you look ahead to what, what do you think will happen the next I don't know, one to five years with maybe just low power wide area networks in general. What what do you think we're going to see? Or is that kind of unknown to you still? No, um, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to give any pronostic there. Uh, you always there are, say that you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah I've, I've seen a bunch no, of these honestly, yeah. uh, So for the last two years, I've been working with this. So, you know, I kind of, I start to have, you know, good feeling of, of, you know, you know, very little domain actually how it's going to evolve that. But IoT and LP1 is, is a so, there's so much diversity in there. Yeah, you have so much hundreds of applications. So some will go entirely NB IoT. Some actually will go all LoRa. Some we go, you know, uh, I a, 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 the only thing I can say is I think there is a, a very large you know background trend and and it's going you know going over for years to uh, to go um, for uh, uh, interconnected private networks. So basically, each company or use case actually deploying its own gateways, for example, for their warehouse or yeah. for their installation or whatever. Uh, but I think what the trend is going to be is they will more and more, they start to see the value of not just using that gateway for my application and my 10 sensors, but to monetize or find a way to monetize that gateway already installed. I'm already paying the cost for that gateway. How can I monetize it for other sensors? And this is where Ilium was kind of a game changer because yeah. they they kind of showed that gateway could be used by multiple people. Although you know, it's it's obvious for anybody working on LoRaWAN, a gateway should could be able to connect any LoRaWAN device. But in reality, very often still today, you install a gateway to connect five temperature sensors, and it's ridiculous. That same right. gateway should be usable by all sensors around. Right. So like basically, like every 
network should be able to roam onto every other or every set of sensors. Exactly. Yeah. And it's purely a backend problem. It's nothing to the gateway actually is receiving those packets, okay? There's nothing wrong there. Right. It's simply that those packets are dumped because people don't know where to route them. Huh. And and in that sense, LoRaWAN is very different from the internet. In the internet, you already you know you always have a source and destination address in every packet. Every time you receive an IP data run, you know what to do with it. You know right. where to route it. A LoRaWAN packet is not like this. Yeah, very often you don't know where to route it. If it doesn't belong to you, you just drop it, which is a shame. Uh, interesting. So there has to be something built into every one of these networks that says, "Hey, route this to." Where, where so there has to be interconnection between those networks. Okay. And you know, th there is a standard to do it. There is guidelines. There is infrastructure, but it's taking time. But I still, I really think that you know, this year is going to be the year where this trend becomes visible. Mm. And I think so. Uh, one of the guys, Travis, is, is right me talking about this. So, is the this side is like why is that is that true? Is that because it's patented and it's it's closed off? Is it like why no. is it so difficult? No, it, it, it's difficult because um, uh, it's. I think it's purely a business problem. It's nothing to do with technology. It's simply what you know. What is my interest to route? Packet to you in the internet. Uh, basically, you pay your ISP to get fiber to the home, and then everything after that is free. Actually, it's not free at all. They pay to get you know a big pipe to their installation for you, and and, and, and so. But uh, it, it looks the magic of the internet. It looks like any packet gets routed for free, which right. is absurd. It's, it's absolutely not true. Okay. So the problem in Loha One is I have installed my gateway. I'm selling my customer fiber temperature sensor. They're paying for it. That's okay. Why should I route for free packets that do not belong to me? What you know, if I cannot make, if I cannot benefit from that, why should I do it? Yeah. And so it's simply a matter of uh, finding a reasonable business model, reasonably easy to set up. Yep. That now I have an interest to share whatever I receive, which is not you know targeted to me, which is not coming from my devices. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and maybe, so, I mean, Helium ends up being the thing that does that because it's... Exactly. And Helium might be an, an aggregator like this because uh, um, a Helium gateway owner doesn't care about the devices. It just cares about the gateway, right? Right. And it wants to send uh, so all these packets So gateway route anything. Yeah. Okay. So, so it might be that in the end, the company will install, instead of installing their gateways, they will install Helium gateway and they will, you know pay a very small price to get their devices routed to the Helium uh, uh, gateway, and yeah. Helium will actually increase their coverage this way. Or, you know, yeah. that, that would be called an aggregator in the cellular industry. Huh. Ah, so many cool things to... I mean, we, it's it's funny. I always look at this stuff as it's... Uh, with LoRa and Helium, it's as if this, like, giant undersea civilization kind of rose up above the waves... And normal people were able to see kind of the back end of how some communication protocol worked. And the civilization kind of looks around and is like, ah, these people aren't ready for it, and like sinks backs down and lets like the engineers continue to do it. And the regular people are just kind of forget about it. But this mm -hmm. is a, it's a cool look into, you know, some of the problems that go along with, with all these different networks who may not be a, one of the guys mm -hmm. on here is saying. And, and the next thing is a very often it's not a technical problem. Yeah. Yeah, not my packet, not my problem. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not my packet. Exactly. You got it right. Today, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that, mm. that might be one thing that is kind of solvable. Um, mm. What else? Like, what else? You, I saw you've in, invented or worked on a ton of different projects. What are you kind of excited on now? Do you feel like the Epic stuff is pretty much done and now it's all business development? Or is there still technological it's, uh, stuff? I don't know. Do? Honestly, technically, it's, uh, it's working really well. It's okay. impressive. And if you... You know, uh, next time you come to Grenoble, come and visit me and I will do a demo. And okay. we'll do a live demo. Cool. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. You will see it works beautifully. Uh, okay. we, we have found, uh, you know, I have found, uh, I'm doing, you know, most of the training to organization, things like this. Huh. And they try to hide. Uh, I give them a beacon and say, you know, I did whatever you want and I'll find it in five minutes. And, and they've put it in crazy place, microwave oven and beams in cars underground in wherever that uh so uh so so this works really well um the uh 
The next thing I'm on now is uh, the Gen 2 of that device is getting direct uh, device to satellite connectivity on it. Huh. Using uh, using LoRa. Okay, so you won't need the cell cell backhaul. So we will never get gateway coverage everywhere in the Alps. Right. So we need a gateway very high up in the sky. Well, that's one way of thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So, uh, so I mean, that's, still... uh, uh, it... that's what I'm working on at the moment. So there's got to be some power issues with that, right? Because you got a significant distance to cross. No, nah, it's 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 uh, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, with uh, so a normal LoRa communication in Europe is 25 milliwatt. In the US, is more 100 milliwatt. You you guys there use more 20 dBm, so it's 100 milliwatt. Okay. Yep. Yep. Of, of radio power in the US. Yep. Yep. Here in Europe, the regulation limits us to 25 milliwatt. Yep. Okay, uh, and uh, so for satellite, we use a little bit more than 100 milliwatt, like 140 milliwatt, mm -hmm. and we can directly reach a geostationary satellite. It's unbelievable. Huh. Oh, it's crazy. Okay, well, many things to uh, many things to know and learn. All right, we got so, this. So, so that that's really coming, uh, and it's not just a science fiction. It's actually working. Yeah. Huh. Uh, we we are working on a commercial product. Very exciting. All right, uh, we got this one here. How many gateways do you need for Epic, and why are you preferring Lore over LoRaWAN for that use case? I think you could. Say ah, good. So um, currently, Epic is directly managing about thirty-five gateways, uh, which is actually uh, what we need simply to to guarantee hundred percent coverage with redundancy on all ski resorts that are customers of us. Okay. So basically, when a ski resort come to us, it's a B2B thing. Yep. They want complete coverage on the domain, yep. which is normal. So we will do a coverage simulation and we will install and operate the gateways required to guarantee coverage everywhere on the ski resort. Of course, when we do that, coverage does not stop at the boundary of the ski resort. We also cover, you know, the mountain at the other side of the valley. We yep. cover everything around. So yep. we progressively, you know, we assembling a puzzle where we're getting coverage where most of the people are yeah. or most of the skiers or outdoor enthusiasts are. Okay. Um, so, uh, but uh, if uh, this uh, first, this beacon here is not just for skiers or it's just not for snow, it's for paragliders, it's for hikers, it's for trailers, it's for mountain bikers. And there is no way we ever going to cover this, right? right. It's, it's way too huge. And this is just about France. What about Switzerland? What about North America? What about, you know, it's huge, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's one reason we actually really looking strongly in satellite at the moment, yeah. uh, but still using LoRa. Okay. And why do, do I prefer LoRa over LoRa one? I do not prefer LoRa over LoRa one. That device here is actually only is using LoRa one to communicate with network. So can communicate with any Helium gateway, any, any LoRa one gateway. It's a pure standard. Laura one device, yep. except in between Laura one packets that is transmitting every, you know, every couple of minutes, roughly, it's also broadcasting a very short Laura beacon. And that Laura beacon is the radio signal you use to do the search. If you ever need to, to find that guy, that guy went to the ground. Yep. It's the last packet was received, I don't know, 30 minutes ago. And in paragliding 30 minutes is a lot. Oh yeah. You have covered a lot of distance. Yeah. So you're dispatching an aircraft or helicopter. Yep. equipped with the, the the finder and the the short LoRa beacon with five miles range is what this thing is going to receive okay and this is the signal is going to be used to home in onto uh onto the uh, the beacon okay so like the last packet received gets you within five miles and once you're within five miles oh, you're or, or not even within but, but it gives you a starting point yeah. and one starting point you uh basically you know search and rescue team uh, they have, and on you guys or, or your colleagues, they have a very clear idea that, you know, if at that time you were here, you were probably on that trajectory, you were trying to reach this mountain or you were trying to reach this valley. Yep. And so they will know where to search. Ah, okay. And the so, thing is with a five mile radius, if you just, you know, uh, uh, either go in circle or if you simply, uh, follow the ridge of valley, if the guy is anywhere within the valley, you're going to catch it. And then so let's the, see, like the, the bubble can't stop at five miles. So, no. you know, it's got to go maybe out to six sometimes and three at other times. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Within 
what distance is it always, or is it you know ninety nine percent reliable? And where does it start to okay. kind of tail off? So, um, so now that you've been playing with radio for you know at least a few years, yeah, yeah. I'm still <laughs> a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So radio is all about statistic. There is not something as what's the range, right? The range depends about everything. So typically, the range between a, a beacon, which is ground based, and an helicopter, we reach five miles. At five miles, we probably lose. 30% of the packet. We'll, we'll receive, you know, two packets out of three. Yeah. Right? But actually receiving one is enough to get you in the right direction. Yeah. And then yep. as you get closer, everything starts to work. Now, if you are performing the same search, ground-based, you're walking, it's a ground caravan looking for somebody, then the range isn't five miles anymore. No. The range the range can be extremely small. If you're on two different sides of a hill, the victim is here and you're looking for it here, well, you'll never receive the signal. Right. Radio waves do not travel through the ground. Right. So right. in some cases, you might end up in extreme cases with range of, you know, three, four hundred meters. So, you know, I don't know in yards or whatever, but yeah. alpha kilometer. Right. OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, so when I do a training to people doing, you know, um, uh, ski, ski rescue, snow rescue, I tell them it's, you know, five miles from the helicopter in good condition and it's never less than 300 meters. So basically, it's never less than a quarter of a mile. Okay, so if you can get within 300 meters, you're going to find them. Yeah, so if you are within a quarter of a mile, you you will you receive a signal. You will receive a signal, okay? Uh, but uh, but uh, air search, as usual, because your antenna is more, in a more elevated position, yeah, is yeah. always, you know, more efficient. There's no, no, no clue and no, no, no way around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any part of this where uh let's say you got a couple of pilots or you've got something like the a paragliding race or you know the big one we know about in the US is the Red Bull X Alps but there's there's hundreds of, of paragliding races mm -hmm. there where all are the paragliders the pilots ever forming a mesh network or that's that's not a thing oh, good oh, exactly so um if you as soon as you press the SOS button as soon as you request help yep. that signal will be catched by surrounding beacons and rebroadcasted. Got it. And okay. it can make a multiple hop to a beacon that actually has LoHa One connectivity yep. or yep. connectivity to a network. That's and then cool. the SON will get to the network yep. and where it needs to be, right? Yep. So uh, basically, um, Zeus beacons, they uh, periodically open listen windows. And if they catch the signal of a nearby beacon in SOS mode, they will retransmit it immediately. OK. Yeah, that, I mean. That makes sense. That's that's how it should it's, work. It's right? a very basic mesh network. Yeah. Uh, and it only works to route SOS, so the most crucial information. Yep. Yep. It okay. will not route to a position when nothing is wrong, uh, because we don't want to actually uh, completely over overflow or I, I mean uh, uh, to flood. We don't want to flood completely the uh, the, the the capacity of our network. Okay. Now that that makes sense. Let's see. There's a comment here that I don't understand, but maybe you get this. What is it? Uh, Tiny GS in reverse. I think it was from something you were explaining a while ago. Oh, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe like the satellite. I, I, no, uh, I no, I don't know what Tiny GS. So I cannot comment on that. Um, right. I'm sorry. Cool. And then there's another guys that the comment is super long. It'll fill up the whole screen. But he's talking about bringing this to the U.S. You guys are in France right now. Do you have plans of of coming to North America? I don't. We have planned to come to the U.S. as soon as we have the. Um, version two of that device with satellite connectivity. So basically the satellite provider we are working with yep. has two birds, two satellite, one over Europe and one other over North America and Canada. Okay. So if we can get satellite connectivity to work from our beacon, that will also open up the uh, North American mar uh, uh, market to us. Yep. Okay. Because in, in US at the moment, uh, we cannot bet on any, we have no clue if there is LoRa one coverage wherever this you know wherever our users would be yeah so we, of course we, i'm totally open you know if you tell me i'm organizing a race i'd like to rent 100 of those devices uh and but i know you can set up the gateways to get coverage on the yeah. area you need yeah yeah so but as epic i cannot guarantee to customers in north america that there'll be coverage where they need it right so until i've got satellites it's suicide for me to go there uh or to go to the consumer market in us Okay. Yeah, yeah. I may, we may go, we may go for a sports event where we have organizing team who know how to deploy LoRa One gateways and guarantee coverage for the event. There, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. And did you say there's only one satellite like above North America that can provide coverage for everything? Yeah. No, come on, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, it's a it's a geostationary satellite, and uh, so it's it's very high up in the sky. <laughs> That's yeah, crazy. It, it, sees, <laughs> it sees actually the entire North America plus uh, a, more than half of the Canada. It doesn't see all the, the very northern part. Right. You know, because by definition, a geostationary satellite is over the equator. Okay. So so it sees everything up to, let's say, 60 degrees north. 60 degrees north, north. yeah, yeah. And, and, and maybe yeah. south as well, huh? That's That seems like a lot of coverage. Hmm. Okay, yeah, this guy's saying there's a LoRa satellite that's been around for about... Uh, Four years over the U.S. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there, there's been you know uh, Lacuna. So multiple companies have launched low Earth orbit Leo satellites. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, but this is not what you're uh, talking about. This is not a Leo satellite. Exactly. Uh, so, but uh, that, there's a huge difference there because a Leo satellite to get 24/7 coverage, you need a very dense constellation. Yeah. Yeah. You need to have always a satellite over your head. Yep. And and if you have just you know a few of those satellites, they will they will come every six hours or something like this. But for a safety beacon, six hours is a long time to wait. Yeah, yeah, it's a long time. If you have a broken leg in the middle of nowhere. When you press the SOS button, if you have to wait six hours, it can be very long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, time seems to stretch out. Uh, let's see, Charbel asking, how deep can the beacon be underground? You're saying it can be under a couple of feet of snow. Uh, 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 we have tested it uh, down to three meter under snow. But it's not a realistic case because three meters in the snow, anyway, you are dead. You're dead. If that ever happens to you, the time it will take to dig you out, you're dead. So you're you, are, you just recover a body. All right? Okay. Wow. So, so survival, survivability in avalanche is down to, let's say, you know, extreme case, very lucky people can be recovered a meter and a, a meter and a half, two meter, max, max, max. And it takes a long time and a lot of people to dig out, to shovel out. Dang, yeah. There's a lot of snow to, to, to pull out. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I was never able to test it under um, really uh, uh, dirt or earth. Uh, yep. I have no such use case. Right. I have tested it in water, though, and uh, it will actually, in, uh, in uh, unsalted water, so in drinkable water, yep. it will actually work uh, nearly down nearly to one meter underwater. So I can still receive the LoRa packets. Yeah. Of a device which is underwater if it's not too deep. Right, right. If they're in a shallow puddle or, or a and, and in salty water, it stops. You know, ten centimeter in the surface, it's dead because salty water is conductive, seawater is conductive, ah, okay. and therefore it's like a Faraday cage. Huh. It it really blocks uh, um, nine hundred megahertz radio waves yeah. extremely quickly. With just like ten centimeter of the beacon, you stop receiving it. It's it's Damn. crazy. I would mm. not have thought there'd be that big of a difference. I mean, that's that's giant. Mm. Mm -mm. Huh. Okay. Cool. So that's the satellite stuff. That's the kind of lore update where you see it going. Um, one of the uh, comments. So I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying that, you know, this is going to be all sensors are going to go satellite. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm saying it makes complete sense for us yeah. as a Epic for our application. That definitely makes sense to try to get this world to work. Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden you have like a, a worldwide, um, a worldwide network, which is super okay. cool. Just get a couple of mm -hmm. All right. Uh, capacity of battery, battery life device when the buttons press. So uh, the, the battery in there is a little bit less than one amp hour. So it's, okay. it's a rather small battery, right? Yep. yep. Uh, if you, if you, uh, you know, the, uh, the activity of the device will depend on how you move. Huh? If you, sure. if you just leave it still on your desk, it will just burn nothing. It will, yep. it will just last for months. Uh, I carry mine on myself as a test, you know, wherever I go, yeah. whatever sport, uh, I, do, I do a lot of uh, biking yeah. and I basically charge it once every two weeks in average. Every two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and we guarantee, you know, minus 20 degrees C. So, you know, really harsh condition, we guarantee, um, uh, I think it's 72 hours continuous activity minimum. So basically, let's assume you are skiing nonstop or walking or running nonstop ab about three days. Jeez. And the, the battery life, the battery life doesn't change when you press the button or not, because the thing is all is periodically taking GPS position and broadcasting them continuously and periodically transmitting them to the network. Because uh, the thing is, 
most accident, in most accidents, people are not even able to press the SOS button. Yeah, that was my They're next question. Yeah. They're unconscious, yeah. right? So basically, if you only start transmitting a uh, position when the user presses the SOS button, in many cases, that will not help you. You will not find it. Right. So we have to be able to find that's part of our, you know, specific. We have to be able to find people that just, you know, did a, you know, huge fall or uh, of a heart attack, or whatever, yep. uh, and and they're not able to press the button. Yeah. Are you doing they, anything just before you with like sudden stops? I know when when I was looking at the paragliding stuff, we used uh, the oyster oyster trackers and one of the, the pieces of feedback was like hey it doesn't have a button you can't turn it on and off you know some of the stuff is like a privacy concern they take it home and mm -hmm. now you know where their home is uh, but mm -hmm. the other piece was like if you're in a an incident in a paraglider you don't you could you could hit the ground before you push the button for sure yeah, is there yeah. like a, a sudden stop kind of trigger like all right once they start falling you know nine meters a second down or 12 meters a second down and then have a sudden stop does it activate there are there any kind of additional i don't i um uh... I think it's part of a thing we are, uh, so basically in the team, we have a, a very good paraglider. I'm, I'm just an you know, amateur, but it, it, as a programmer in the team, we have a guy which is who's really strong in paragliding. Yeah. And part of his job is to develop a paragliding profile for that device that will automatically detect a fall. So okay. we have, a, we have a, a pressure sensor in there, so yeah. we can actually detect altitude pretty yeah. accurately, and we can detect a fall. So basically, if you have, you know, a continuous fall, shock, then nothing. Yeah. We should be able to uh, automatically count it or go in SOS mode. Yeah. Okay. So there's like an accelerometer or something in there. Okay. Also, you know, being in SOS mode, if there is no network to receive it, uh, it's best effort, but there is no guarantee. If there is no, you know, the problem is the closer you're to the ground, the less coverage probability you have because yeah. your, your gateways are, you know, miles and miles and miles away. So uh, the reason we are doing it is very often they fly in group, you know, so they might be another paraglider in the vicinity that will receive that SOS without even noticing it. And his beacon will forward it. Yeah. Yep. No, that makes sense. Ah, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, Cause Grenoble was a, you got, you got plenty of people who are flying, who are doing fun stuff when they're not, uh, not work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. actually, they fly uh, 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 during the lunch pause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, they fly. Uh, they fly at lunch break. Yeah, it's a very different thing. It's it's funny. I haven't been over to Europe to fly, but it's like that's one of the one of the trips that you do as a paraglider is like fly in Europe mm -hmm. from the U.S. side because it's such a different thing here. It's it's pretty rugged flying, and over there, it's we laugh about like, oh, you guys just like lay out on the grass slope, and you know, there's not like a ton of stuff to catch your lines or cut them, and, and we basically don't have really clean launches here. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's, it's a bit rougher for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little more, a little more cowboy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we don't have, we don't have trams or lunch stations or coffee shops at the tops of mountains. It's, we don't have a lot of that. <laughs> and ski lift to go there. And a ski lift to go up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's, it's funny. There's probably like three places in the U.S. where they have a ski lift to get to the top. Um, yeah. So yeah, very different thing. What um, what do you do when you're like for hobby stuff? What do you do when you're not at work? Are you are you still kind of? I don't, uh, honestly, I have two works. Yeah. Uh, one is actually uh, making sure this stuff works. Sure. And uh, my other uh, part time job is to I'm building an airship. Like a zeppelin, like a a big. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, so, except. Uh, so it's an helium filled uh, envelope, right? With yeah. uh, but it's with electric propulsion. So okay. it's purely electrical, okay. and it's not shaped like a zeppelin at all. You don't look at it like a cigar shaped thing. Right. It's more like a uh, like a like a UFO or whatever. Like a, huh. it's a, it, it's circular. Like a saucer, shape. yeah, yeah. It, exactly. And uh, so the exact name is Taurus, but I you know like a like yeah, yeah. the uh, like a donut. Like a donut, exactly. It's a flying donut. It's a giant flying donut. Okay. Do you have any pictures of this thing, or is it still in? Uh... Actually, I do. Yes. Yeah. I'm not uh, sure if you can share or not, but we'll figure something out. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Can I? Ah, uh, yeah. I can share my screen, right? Yeah. Try it out. See if it okay. works. Let Let me. Uh, no, it only uh, screen sharing only works with Google Chrome. But. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, a, a giant flying donuts with electric uh, with electric propulsion system, and it can actually fly uh, any direction. So it can do stationary flight. It can just climb uh, like a helicopter. It can translate. Huh. Uh, so it's it's going to be a 
very fun uh, aircraft to fly. And is it a one one person, single person? Yeah, uh, two seater. Two seater. Okay. And you you'd said that like if it flies, you fly it. Is that that's true? Did I catch that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. I'm, so, so actually, aeronautics is a uh, uh, predates my passion for uh, for radio. So, really? Okay. So, I have a you know I have a, a glider pilot license, a plane pilot license. I'm actually working on the helicopter pilot license. Okay. Uh, and of course, I want to be able to fly uh, airships. <laughs> huh. Obviously. And have you flown an airship before, or not yet? No. So actually, we are lucky enough that in Grenoble, there is another airship being built, and we actually inflated it this week. So. There is, is this, a is real this on the airship like where do flying I see for the first time for like you know maybe hundred years. There is a true airship uh, being built in Grenoble, and the, the the guy building it wants to break the world speed record for airship with it. And what is that? What is the airspeed record? Uh, hundred thirty kilometers. An hour. So it's it would be it would be like ninety miles an hour. Which is a lot for because you got to push a lot of air out of the way. There's got to be some kind it's of physical. It's huge, limit. right? Yeah. It, uh, so his airship is 600 cubic meter. That seems like so, a lot. So by airship standard, it's a very small airship. Yeah, yeah, but Jesus, for anything else, it's a giant thing, huh? Yeah. And then are you also? I see a little. Uh, RC, looks like an RC plane behind your little remote control. Yeah, yeah. I, so, so, and I also uh, drones and uh, and. Uh, Turbine-powered, uh, small RC planes, thing like this, yeah. Okay. But that was really hobby. So I haven't done that, you know. I've been too busy for the past few years to to actually fly them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I really hope this year I'm going to be piloting for real uh, the airship we're building. That would be great. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty rad. I had a and, and I will use Loha for communication. <sighs> Naturally, right. <laughs> so, so the uh, yeah. Go ahead. The, the 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 communication between the control stick and the electric uh, propulsion system is going to be radio, and it's actually going to going to be using LoRa. Huh? I'd always thought of LoRa as being like a higher was it a higher latency thing, but I guess it doesn't matter if the distance is that short. Uh, so I'll I'll be using LoRa in the 2.4 gigahertz band. Okay. So which is a higher data rate what that what you used to with Helium gateways or with LoRa one. Okay. So actually, LoRa can also be pretty good at very robust communication short range. So huh. the idea there is, is I'm not targeting long range. I'm targeting, you know, 20 meters maximum. Right. But I air. want an extremely robust communication because it's replacing the wires. You know, I'm basically, yeah. my life, yeah. my, I, I'm going to have to trust it <laughs> flying. Oh, that's right. <laughs> now, is that a common thing? I don't know anything about this. Is that common that, that folks will use LoRa at 2.4 or is that uncommon? Uh, for uh, so uh, there are 2.4 gigahertz chipset for LoRa. I don't think it's very commonly used. It's it's clearly not as well known mm -hmm. and as uh, as the uh, the sub gigahertz version that you guys are using and we are using for the safety weekend, for example. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but it's it's a it's very good chip because uh, it uh, the 2.4 gigahertz band has a huge advantage that it's available worldwide. Okay. And you can build fairly high data rate application in that band. You can build a what? Okay. Uh, you, you, so you can you can build high data rate application, so oh, very low rate. latency application. Okay. Okay. Uh, but it's also very crowded. There's a lot of Wi-Fi guys in there, and you know all those those systems. So actually, using LoRa there makes sense because you have the robustness of LoRa, but in a band where that like, you can use everywhere, no regulation problem, no no power limitation, and all the all, all that uh, problems that you have with your sub gigahertz. Huh. What, so what's the data rate and what's the power kind of that you're pushing out of this application? That you're using? Uh, power is very low. Power The power I'm, I'll be using is like a 10 milliwatt, extremely low, because the range that I want to achieve is fairly small. Yep. Okay. And uh, in terms of data rate, you're, you're talking about 100 kilobit per second. Okay. okay. So not like but an Ethernet cable. Which is but it's by lower fast. standard, very high. Yeah, yeah. Not Wi-Fi-like, we agree. Yeah. Uh, but infinitely more robust. Huh. And... I don't understand why that would be more robust. Is there like a specific reason it's got to do? Yeah, yeah, because LoRa is using a spread spectrum modulation. So, okay. uh, so intrinsically, uh, you know that LoRa, uh, LoRa receiver will recover its signal either way under noise or actually also buried into interference. So okay. at your receiver antenna using LoRa, the interference level might be higher than the signal you actually want to receive and you will still receive it. Huh. Whereas, your, your Wi-Fi receiver 
if there is interference in the channel, well, there's no Wi-Fi anymore. Huh. Your, 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 your Wi-Fi signal needs to be stronger than the interference, the code channel interference. Ah, it's crazy. Okay. And then are there other, are there other I guess, uh, frequencies that you can use LoRa on? I, I didn't understand that you could use it on anything. Well, other of course. Uh, you, you can use... Uh, you can use the LoRa, but for example, in the, uh, you know, this is uh, the communication with satellites. Uh, okay. One of what? the bands that we'll use is the, what's called the S band. It's a band which is around 2.1 gigahertz, okay. which is dedicated for space communication okay. or Earth to space communication. Uh, and of course, uh, you have a lot of people here in Europe using uh, LoRa, a lower in frequency in the UHF band, around 160 megahertz. So it's all, it's all actually, it's not a, a technical problem. Again, it's a regulation problem. Oh, okay. And you have some bands open there for a device to device communication or machine to machine communication in the, in the uh, lower UHF band here in Europe. And, and you have tremendous range in this, you know, uh, low at 160 megahertz, you hundreds of kilometers if you want. Really? Oh, that's right. With, with relatively low power. With less than one watt. It's crazy, yeah. There's like there's so much in the world I just don't understand. It's I say my my yeah. ignorance can be stunning. Yeah, radio communication is a is a more than a century old. Yeah, and uh, many things going around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, tell, we got we got a couple of radio geeks on here, so you okay. might get a couple of those. Ah, uh, Laura versus so if no Laura is not FHSS. It's uh, FHSS for stands for frequency hopping spectrum. LoRa use um, spectrum spreading, so it's basically taking a very low bit rate uh, um, information and spreading it over a, a wide band using chirps. So every ones and zeros of information is actually mapped onto chirps, and chirps are frequency ramp. So a LoRa signal, if you look at, look at it with a spectrum analyzer, is a very wide band signal conveying very little information or very low data rate information. And, and the, the beauty of that is that the receiver can receive only very partial information or a, a very little, you know, most of that spectrum might be interfered. Whatever sneaks through is enough for the demodulator to recover the information. That's rad. Um, when, you, when you and your friend first came up with it, we'll go back to the beginning. Was there like a, a moment of insight or was this something where you guys were like banging your heads against the wall for, for years? No, uh, th there was an Eureka moment. Yeah. So basically the history of uh, LoRa is I was working on a, on a purely software implementation of a GPS receiver at the time. Okay. And, and it was working. And, uh, and I said, yeah, basically look at the sensitivity of a GPS receiver, minus 160, crazy. Uh, at the watts, it, basically it, you receive signal which has which are way under the noise floor. It looks impossible when you first right, start. Right. And and I said basically, if we could do that in a low cost chip, but just you know for device to device communication, uh, that would be brilliant. Uh, I'm sure there is a market for that. Yeah. And uh, and at that time, I had that concept, but I didn't have any technical solution. And that's when I met Olivier, my mate, the other co inventor of Laura. Yeah. And uh, he was able to actually more or less put that in the equation. And at one point he said, Nicola, we have only two choices. We can use chirps or we can use Dirac's. Dirac is the exact opposite of chirps. It's all the energy concentrated in one very small peak or one yeah. burst of energy very, very short in time. Yeah. And I said, you know, bursts are not really good. You know, in the world of radio, uh, uh, concentrating energy over a very short period of time, uh, it's good for lasers, it's not good for radio. So right. let's try with chirps. And it worked. <laughs> That's huh. it. When when you define that relationship a little bit, and you think about kind of the the side that you brought to it and the side that he brought, I've noticed that in these partnerships, you basically can't both be the same thing. You're just duplicating efforts. Like, what do you mm -hmm. think that you were bringing in and that he was bringing in that was kind of created this this eureka? Uh, I had the. Eureka moment. I think my uh, strengths was to have a very clear vision because, think, you know, rewind back in time in 2010, the concept of IoT, the, the term IoT didn't even exist, right? There was no IoT. Yeah. Everybody was buzzing about, you know, 3G. That, that was a big thing. It was a 3G. I don't even know if 4G was anywhere in the pipe, right? Yeah. But it was just higher that rate, higher that rate, higher that rate on your cell phone. And so, 
coming with, with the concept of a very low data rate, very low throughput, very low power, long range communication system uh, was a bit disruptive. And uh, not a lot of people believed uh, it was a good idea, but I had a very, you know, strong feeling this was the right way to go and that there was there would be a need for it yeah because i was very strongly sensing that machine to machine communication were coming and that battery powered com radio communication would need something else than 3g and 4g right and it didn't exist and then what, what and, is, and, you said it's olivier and voilà and and olivier is a lot more uh i'm not very analytical i have a you know kind of i would say insights and things like this okay he's a real scientist he he would be the guys you know bringing or putting putting flesh you know real the hard stuff he will yeah. uh <laughs> he will write down the equation and say this is impossible it's not gonna work <laughs> or or maybe we have a chance yeah. exactly oh uh, that's cool and do you guys still work together Are you still keep in touch or no oh well uh, so uh olivier is still with stentec i am not but we still keep in touch yes yeah, yeah. Do you think you'll work on projects together again? Or was that just like a one? Because he's a no, school buddy of yours, right? We will, um, we will probably work on project. Uh, and, you know, he knows everything I'm doing with uh, with uh, Apic. Uh, yeah. He's been giving me a hand from time to time, you know, providing ideas, all of that. So, no, no, we, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll work again together. Yeah, that's, that's always a cool thing. You find a good good partner, whether it's a partner in life and it's your wife or it's a partner in business and it's someone who brings something to the table you don't have. It's a, it's a pretty special thing. I think a lot of people don't understand uh, how both powerful kind of on the success side that oh, can be, definitely. you know, as yeah. well as interpersonally. Yeah. yeah, it's a big deal. And my, my partner in Apic, the other co-founder is uh, Francois Forza. So he's running all the business side of things. Yeah. You know, I've been, so he's the third guy in the Laura story he, yeah. because, you know, as soon as we had the concept of Laura, we looked for a business guy to actually help us sell it, right? Right. Sell the idea, sell the concept. And this was uh, Francois. And actually, uh, Francois, we still meet every day. We are, you know, we are both active in uh, Apic. He's, he's basically running Apic at the moment. Yeah. And, you know, we, we just work on a, on a daily basis and we've been with that for like nearly 20 years now. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Ah, that's good to hear. Super cool. You go well. I will. Um, I'll have to come out and visit you if you're in Grenoble. I know it's a, a beautiful place. Yeah, it's a good the, the house is big enough to uh, to accommodate you, yeah. and oh, the cool. spots are not really far. Okay, you can fly 20 minutes from here. Ah, oh, that's rad. So I, I went out there. Geez, this must have been oh five or something to go ski. Um, mm -hmm. I my grandfather's Austrian. I grew up kind of skiing. Uh, hmm. a bunch and we went out there to ski and uh my buddy who had lived there funnily enough was also crazy about things that fly he now flies planes up in canada but he had a he worked for a business that did hot air balloon rides and the owner of the business had of course like the big balloons you take up a bunch of people up in but he also had a single person hot air balloon that was That's I think great. It like a cloud hopper and him and his buddies would at the end of the day or like whenever they didn't have to work they'd take this cloud hopper off and go fly it wherever you fly a balloon but it's mm -hmm. like that's what i think of when i think of granola is like oh it's just crazy flying stuff and that's really the spirit i want to find with uh, our airship is uh, being able to you know early morning or late evening to fly but with the convenience of going back to base yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's because that's always like the adventure whether it's paragliding or um a hot air balloon yeah. is you, you don't know where you're going to land you could you could be anywhere you have to be prepared to land far away yeah 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 no, that's that's mm -hmm. the, the fun part of it Ripping, dude. Well, Nicola, thanks a ton for coming on. It's been really exciting to uh, to chat with you. I've, yeah, this is super cool. I'm glad we get to kind of share this conversation uh, with each other as well as with the rest of the world. Is there My pleasure. Else? Yeah. Anything else yeah. that you want to kind of wrap up or hit? Um, it's api-k.com. I think it is. If it's, I think I put yeah, it in exactly. the description. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And then yeah. when do you think that's going to be available in the US? You said you guys are working on some satellite know. stuff. Uh, Unknown. If you ask me, I like it to be able, you know, end of this year. Sure. Now, if but what does Francois ask, say? <laughs> the, the real technical team of Francois, it might be more, you know, uh, Q1, Q2 next year. Okay. Cool. Super but, cool. Uh, well, there's a um, there's a race here in um, Utah that uh, that might be super cool to do like a test run and like fun kind of marketing press stuff, and that's in the end of October. 
Um, it's actually the yeah. first hike and fly or one of the first hike and flies. But we don't need the satellite version for that. Right. We right, can right, just exactly. send you the different devices. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Send them, dude. You got to come over and help set them up. That'll be what we'll do. We'll make like a fun trip out. Oh, so because the fun part is actually setting up the antennas and the gateways. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, Monitoring the race is not fun, but actually installing the gateways is usually yeah. very interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Getting up in the mountain and like figuring out how you're going to fasten it and how you're going to get back all and all that stuff. Exactly, totally exactly. Yeah, cool. yeah. Very cool. That's the part I prefer. Yeah. Ripping, man. Well, again, thanks for your time. I will, um, we're in connection on email, so I'll make sure I follow up with you there. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on. Super cool to share the time with you. Well, thanks for getting in touch. And it was a pleasure talking with you. Right on.